Thank you, Jeff. That was beautiful. Welcome to church. It's great to see you all here as we worship the Lord together this morning. And uh, if you're with us online, I invite you to mark your attendance by saying hello in the comments in the line below. I might even hit like or subscribe or share it with a friend. Uh, by the way, if you make a comment online, I'll pay you. No, uh, it just helps us as a church uh, to connect with our neighbors. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Uh, a few things that are going on in the life of the church that I'd like you to be aware of is that uh, we're inviting those who would be interested to be a part of our summer choir. Uh, we'll take all voices uh, and all people, so just come 30 minutes before church, and uh, we'll quickly go through uh, the, the choir music for the day. It's generally going to be a song that you already know. Uh, and how do I know that? Because you'll show up and you'll know it. It'll be great. <laughs> and we'll enjoy singing together. Um, Another thank you, we are also uh, offering refreshments now, something we couldn't do during the pandemic, and so downstairs, I know there's lots of goodies uh, ready for us, and so if you come, you can enjoy those. And thank you for the United Methodist Women for the month of June, uh, who are helping to coordinate that for us. Uh, if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, just let uh, Joyce know, and she'll be glad to connect you in that way. She already said all the prayer about that. All right, and John Page is letting me know that we have, you know, in August, we're gonna be having the yard sale. And so if you have items that you'd like to donate for that, uh, we can start collecting, which is great. Uh, and so just get in touch with John and he'll help you get coordinated with that. This next week, uh, the uh, state of New Hampshire, they have a uh, food group that's going to be coming into town Thursday and it's going to be at the Walmart parking lot. Uh, they're looking for a few volunteers who'd like to help. So if you're available, uh, they'd like you to come at 11 o'clock on Thursday to help out. Um, but uh, it's a couple hours from 12 to noon helping to pass out, I think they were talking about boxes that are about 35 pounds or so. If you can lift that much and willing to volunteer, I think they'd be glad to have you be a part of that. Uh, but again, that's coming up this coming Thursday. Uh, one announcement that's not in your bulletin or anywhere is that at uh, Warren, at the Methodist Church, uh, they're putting together a summer concert. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, one or two of the singers uh, during our Christmas concert that we did together as a church here, and we're putting a concert in the park uh, at Warren. And so if you're in the area and you'd like to come hear some good music, Saturday at 5 o'clock, and I'll be manning a barbecue behind there. So it'll be great to just connect. If you're interested, uh, there's some flyers in the back, uh, and more information will be sent out by Facebook as well to be a part of. Um, and as we continue in our time of worship, I invite you to stand as we sing Hope of the World. Uh, I invite you to uh, sing as the words are in front of us.
Good morning. A beautiful morning that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us join together in our call to worship. In the midst of life's storms, God is there. In the darkness and terror, God is with us. Rise up, people of God, for you are loved and saved. And let us go and join with an elbow hub, just bump, just to say hello to our neighbors and our friends and those at home. Say hello to someone in your family. The Red Hat Band. <clears throat> oh, gee. If you mess with me, I'll back that way up. <laughs> Did you want this? I'll be singing that first one. <laughs> I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. You see what a good job I did with the clicker? What a wonderful way to start a service, listening to our choir. It sounds like we're home and together again. Amen. Our scripture lead reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty nor majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. But oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was out cut off from the land of the living for the tr transgression, excuse me, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any conceit in, deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justly many, will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you so much, Gail. It's great to have your uh, leading in liturgy this morning and being a part of that with us. As uh, we are in this season after the pandemic and starting to come back together, it's great to have the choir and have refreshments and be able to worship together. It's an awesome feeling to be able to worship together. But we're also recognizing that there is this experience that we're going through in this time, which is a experience of trying to figure out what normal looks like again. And during this past year, there's been an interesting experience. It's called the post-COVID trauma experience or stress disorder. And uh, lots of things have come up in this time of the pandemic. Uh, domestic violence has been on the increase. Mental health issues have been on the increase. And so as we exit this time, it makes sense that as a church, we're focusing for a time on healing and how God wants to provide healing for our wounds and particularly our inner wounds. Uh, you all remember the lie that we had as children, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a great lie, isn't it? Because, you know, the truth is, the words that we remember for people sometimes stick with us a lot longer than those scars that we might have gotten on the playground. In fact, if I were to ask you to remember a playground scar, you might not remember, but you might remember what somebody had said to you. And the truth about it is those inner wounds stick with us for a long period of time and provide a, a need for us to receive a deeper form of healing from God and that God does ultimately put his loving arms around us that we would know of his embrace and his care for us in our entire life. As we think through this season, uh, I'm focusing on the scripture from Matthew 11. He says, Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. 
I know that I've shared this before, but I know during the lockdown period of time, it left me too much time on my own to beat myself up with all of those words that had hit me as a kid and, and thinking through, was that true? Was that not true? Am I worthy? Am I not worthy? God wants to invite us to a time of rest where we hear his voice, his love, and his affirmation rather than the continuous torment that we continue to put ourselves in. And so today, as we're talking about this work of God to do that inner work of healing, we're going to open up the scripture today and hearing from Isaiah 53 that talks about how God has met our deepest needs in Jesus Christ. And there are three major areas in which Christ has done this. And the first is to talk about rejection. I I love how that passage opens. Who has believed our message? Who has heard? Who would have even believed? that this person, this one who would be our Messiah, would be that one because he raised up as a tender shoot. He was somebody who was not appealing to the eye. There was nothing in him that would attract us to him. And we hear from that, that he was rejected, that he was despised. He was someone who was familiar with pain, a man of sorrow. And as you think about life experience, One of the greatest things that we suffer that is not a physical ailment, but inside, is a deep feeling of being rejected. Perhaps when you were a youth or a child, somebody said something to you that made you feel unworthy, made you feel that you weren't pretty enough, strong enough, courageous enough, that you didn't have what it takes to make it in life. Well, that's described as a wound that just resides deeply within us that continues to grow and and linger there until there is some salve, some healing presence to provide some sense of healing to that wound. I'm reminded of a story of a, a young boy whose family had come from another country and they hadn't yet learned the customs or the language of the land. But as the family was eager eager to have their child learn those customs and language, sent their child on to uh, preschool and hope with the hope that everything would go well and that that young boy would learn the language and, and get along and make some new friends. But by the end of that first week, nobody can be crueler than other kids. And the other kids decided that this one was weird, not like them. And so at the end of the week, They decided to throw the child into a ditch and throw stinging nettles on him. The deeper wound that this child felt of not feeling included, not being connected with other persons. And I wonder, as I shared just that little brief story, you know, of course, the child came home and and shared this story with the parents and and how hurt he was. And the parents, of course, embraced the child and said they loved him. But that wound of not being able to connect with those who are in his classmates, knowing that for the rest of his time, wondering, you know, how it is I might connect or he could connect with the rest of the world, that that would be that story that that child would carry on. I'm wondering, in your life, there there may have been other experiences, some story in which you were told from a parent or from a a classmate that you didn't have what it takes uh, to make that connection. Well, we, we hear that that is a lasting wound, Uh, and that the rest of our life can be spent trying to make up for that woundedness, sometimes overdoing it, (laughs) overacting in a way to somehow compensate for something that has been gone wrong. Most of us in some way or another have a lingering impression that we really are not worthy, we don't really connect with society, that there's something amiss about our lives, and so what happens is we spend the rest of our life trying to cover up for that woundedness, trying to pretend like we're somebody better than we are, somebody else because we're not comfortable in our own skin for who we truly are. Well, all of that is part of that woundedness. It's part of the lie of the evil one because God has created us in God's image. He created us perfect. God does not make trash. In Psalm 139, it says, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That even before you took your first breath, God knew you completely. And if you're perfect in God's eyes, who is anyone else to declare that you're not okay? The truth is that God loves you fully and completely just for who you are. Because you are who God created for you to be. 
There's this old story about how someone had gone to heaven and was having an argument with God because he wasn't as great as some of the other prophets or or preachers. And God's response was, I didn't want you to try to be like them. I wanted you to try to be who you are. And you'd spent your whole life trying to be somebody else. Where are you? God has put all of us together in the way he has created us as a, a holy mosaic, a wonderful puzzle in which everyone's face shines as they provide the talents and gifts that God has provided to each, that we might provide that beautiful mosaic picture of the story of God to the world, to provide that image, that reflection of the creativity and the diversity of who God is in and through our life. So how is God has provided healing in that woundedness, that deeper sense of brokenness that we experience in our lives? Into our brokenness, God sent Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself was rejected. Jesus Christ himself was despised. He was one who people did not esteem because of their beauty or their outward experience. There was nothing that he had that people would say, oh, well, there's somebody who's going to be a great person growing up. But instead, he was like this tender shoot this sort of unseen thing that sort of uh, goes through the ground. Jesus Christ knows our experience of our rejection. In fact, one of the truths of Scripture is that the glory of Christ is that he knows of our pain. He knows of our weakness. He is able to identify with our struggles. And that is a beautiful thing to know about God. God is not simply out there on a giant cloud or living on Mars or someplace out there, but indeed, He comes to live with us in our own shoes. He was with that child when he was rejected by his peers, being thrown into the ditch. And he knows what that feels like. And because of that experience of being rejected, we are familiar with the Lord who does not disconnect from our pain, but instead embraces our pain and makes that pain his own, so that we are not alone in our suffering but that the Lord himself knows of our pain and embraces our struggles, our fears, and our foolishness because indeed God is able to do great and amazing things. Truth for scripture is that God continues to choose the weak and the foolish to do amazing things to confound the wise and the strong. That is the theme all the way through scripture. We hear how God called David, that little shepherd boy, who was the youngest of all of his siblings, who was esteemed as having only enough worth to watch the sheep while his brothers went off to go fight the army. And God looked down and says, there's someone I can use. Somebody who's on the low end of the totem pole, somebody who everyone else considers to be worthless, that's the one I want to use. And David was made strong in the eyes of the world because God used him for his purpose, because his heart was right with God. And ultimately, that inner healing happens when we recognize that even though we may feel weak and ashamed and foolish, that that's exactly where we meet the presence of the Holy Spirit. That it is in that brokenness that God comes into our brokenness in his own brokenness through Christ and says, I love you, my dear child. Trust me with your life that through you, with you and no one else, I can change the world. Dwight L. Moody had said, the world has yet to see what would happen with one soul that is 100% sold out to God. Even with our weakness and our foolishness, God can accomplish great new things. And so it causes us to put on some new lenses. Paul had said in Corinthians, he said, we no longer regard one another from a human point of view. Because we once regarded Christ in that way, and what happened? We rejected him, and he was put to the cross and crucified. So now we have to reject those lenses that the world gives us that esteem one another by our externals, by our physical attributes, by strengths and, and wisdoms, but rather to put on the lenses of faith and of God. And then that way, God does amazing things that even go below the radar of what we might not see God is able to use even our rejection and our brokenness. But it does require that we trust God, that we recognize our brokenness, and instead of hiding and holding it down in our shame, 
to open our hearts to welcome God into that brokenness. As Christ himself was broken, that we might meet God in that shame, in that guilt, in that moment, that we might experience of his healing in our innermost being. The second area in which Christ meets us in our brokenness, it talks about how here is one who became sin for us, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Indeed, it says he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And often when we hear those words transgressions and iniquities, we think of them being the same, but just to to split them out a little bit. In the Old Testament, there are all kinds of laws and regulations about what you should do when you do certain things. And there is a whole set of uh, legalistic sacrifices that are provided for sins that you committed when you weren't even aware of it. (laughs) And those are the transgressions. Ways that you have crossed the boundary and weren't even aware that you had somehow inadvertently crossed the boundary. So we could say those things that we've done wrong in life without knowing we did them wrong when we did them, right? The things that we have screwed up just because. And then iniquities has to do with purposefulness, uh, being purposeful in our iniquities. That is, when we have the thought that maybe I should speak badly of another, or do something that would harm or injure myself or somebody else, or to be a part of something that I know I should not be a part of, then there is also a set of criteria in which God, through the sacrificial, would provide forgiveness for that iniquity, that is purposeful sin. But it says in this passage that Jesus Christ himself was pierced for our transgression and he was crushed for our iniquities, both of those pieces. So it means that those things that you didn't know that you screwed up with... (laughs) and the things that you messed up on purpose, both of those are held in the hands of Christ. And that on that cross, when he held out his hands to God and he says, it is finished, he said he's covered it all. (laughs) It's all within his grasp and that there is nothing beyond the extent of the sacrifice that he has provided for us. But to back up for a moment, what is the impact of sin in our life and how is that related to inner healing? It relates in a number of different ways. The first is when we participate in sin, it causes us to be diminished in understanding who we are in relationship to God. And that enters into this idea of sin, which is this separation between us and God, us and God's best, us and who God has called us to be. And it begins with the subtle pieces, even in our own thoughts, where Jesus says, even in your own mind, if you hate your brother, it's as if you've killed them. Or if you looked at a woman with lust in your heart, it's as if you've committed adultery. Because he's pointing to the fact that any of that daylight between us and God creates this separation of darkness between who we are and who God calls us to be. But more than that, it also causes us to understand ourselves differently as persons who need to be ashamed of who God is or who we are in God. And we spend the rest of our life trying to pretend like everything's okay. And more than that, we carry around with us a bag of guilt, a bag of shame. I'm not good. I'm not worthy. I'm not okay. And maybe that starts to weed its way into understanding who you are as a person. That I am evil, or I am somebody who is a part of all the negative things in the world. And that continues to weigh on us, and we wonder, can I ever be okay? Can I ever really be forgiven? Can I really ever be clean of all the sin and weight? Of all the things I've either done on purpose or the things I've not done on purpose, can I ever really know for sure that I am okay with God? That weight does hold on to our hearts. That is an inner brokenness that continues to weigh on us through the journey of our life. But what has happened is that Jesus Christ has come to meet us in that brokenness, that he himself became sin for us. That is how much God loves us, that he who knew no sin, the the innocent one, the one who is God himself incarnate, chose to take on that role of becoming our sin So that when he goes to the cross and is pierced for our iniquities and pierced for our transgressions, that he is covering our doubt and our shame, that all of our sin is completely forgiven, forgiven, that there could be no doubt because it has been made secure in the blood of Jesus Christ, 
that there is no longer any separation between us and God, and that God has come that full direction, the whole journey to meet us in our moment of brokenness, so that no longer do we need to beat ourselves up for those things that we have done or things that we may have done, those late night demons that beat you up because of all the things you're not sure of. Jesus Christ has paid it all. And that inner brokenness, that inner need for healing is to let that go to God. To say to God, Lord, I need your healing and I recognize the sacrifice of Christ that he has made me whole. And to begin the journey of trust with God. That he indeed has exposed our sin at the cross. That when we look to Christ on the cross, it was our sin and your sin individually that held him there. But the good news is that three days later, Christ rose from the dead, proving that indeed Christ's love conquers all and that sin itself has been paid for. And no longer does sin or shame or guilt need to hold us back, but that we can live fully into the promises of God for us. Indeed, it says that as sheep have all gone astray, we've all gone our own different directions. But we need that work of God the finger of God, to touch that brokenness that we would know for sure that we are saved, that we have been forgiven, and to know of God's love. The final area in this passage of Isaiah 53 that is described is this description about being oppressed. And this is a description of of those experiences where justice has been denied, where your voice has been silenced, where your pain has gone unseen, where without your choice or without your decision, things have been done to you or done on your behalf without your permission. And what is happening here is God is addressing in this passage of Isaiah 53 what he is describing as that suffering servant. That is, those who are called by God, who live in this life, who feel the pain of living in a broken world. Believe it or not, maybe you know this, but people won't always give you a high five for doing the right thing. Uh, In high school, it used to be said, you know, that the popular thing is not always right, and the right thing is generally not popular. In this world, the world isn't going to pat you on the back because you love Jesus. That's just not the experience of faithful people through the generations. In fact, the the experience of faithful persons has been that throughout generations, those who are willing to voice God's voice are often pushed aside, overlooked, rejected. I think of the prophet Jeremiah, where when he came out and started to tell the king that he needs to turn his heart right to God, threw him in a pit. And when the opposing army came and took over the city, they dragged him in slavery back to their country. He was a suffering servant, one who was willing to put his voice to what God had said. And maybe in your life you've experienced a sort of unrighteous opposition or oppression. We hear in Luke 4 where Jesus says, The Lord has anointed me, his spirit has anointed me, so that I might proclaim good news to the poor and liberty for those who are oppressed. God delights when his servants speak out his word, or do what God has called. But that doesn't mean that God is going to provide some sort of holy protection as you do so. More often than not, God allows us to live into that same example of Jesus Christ that when we live into God's faithfulness, that we live into the same persecution of Christ. And that through that experience, other people become aware of the reality of what is true. That's sort of that whole martyr piece, that when one is one who is crucified or one who is oppressed or one who is killed unrighteously, it gives voice through their blood of the unrighteousness, the injustice. And sometimes there is giant change as a result of one person's faithfulness, even if it results in sacrifice and distress. God himself meets us in that experience of being oppressed and that Jesus Christ went to went before the judge. It says he was without voice. He was brought before his oppressors, before his accusers and still was silent. But even we recognize while Jesus was silent, how much of his own experience of oppression and injustice has been 
echoed throughout generations. The very story of Jesus' crucifixion has echoed through all the places of the world that we might know of God's love and justice, even through one who was silent. Jesus' example is that we must live justly and innocently, but also faithfully. That inner pain of feeling that, who is going to know my story? Who is going to know my pain? The act of faithfulness is to trust that even though someone else might not echo your story, that your story rings true in the heart of God and that we are never lost or forsaken, but together we walk in journey with the one who loves us, the one who knows our life, and the one in whose hands we are never lost, and that Christ himself has experienced our brokenness. So as we review, we hear about our rejection, we hear about our sin and we hear about oppression and we recognize that each of those are areas in which we have experienced inner brokenness and the need for inner healing god calls us we're hearing about this process of healing that some part or another of this story rings true for you that i believe the holy spirit has been speaking to your heart in one word or another that's saying yes this is something you need to put into my hands today that you might allow me in to provide healing as I was prayerfully reflecting on this word for us, I, I had this image in my mind of this wonderful pitcher of water. And inside that pitcher of water, there was a sponge. But that sponge was dried out and hard. It had not yet received the refreshing water. And I think about that so often for believers and those who hear the Christian word is that so often in life, the hardness of the world, we've hardened our heart to that, but it's hard for us to open up, to be real with God, and to receive of that refreshing Holy Spirit. That is the work of God, that he wants us to be able to receive that healing work of God in our lives today. Because it's, it's enough to know, to hear the love of God, but also then to really allow your hearts to be open to that refreshing, healing love this day. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you do not leave us lost, forsaken, or abandoned. Then in our rejection, in our experience of life of being beaten, forgotten, or lost, that in a very real way, you also have met us there. That your desire for us is that we might come before you as our friend, as our healer, because you know our pain, because of great love that you provide for us, that we might know of your touch of healing, your tenderness in those innermost broken places. And so we come before you as your people, asking that your spirit would come to provide your healing this day. And this we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond today with the sermon, um, we're going to be singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. As we sing this song, as we lift up this friendship that Jesus offers for us, it talks about how we often carry our pain around with us, but simply with that moment of prayer to meet God in our brokenness. And so I invite us as we stand and sing together, if you would want to come forward for prayer, uh, to make use of the railing or to talk with me, I'd be glad to be in prayer with you today. But let us stand as we sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus.
I invite you to be seated. During this uh, time, we haven't yet adjusted to passing the offering plates. We'll start to do that sometime, but uh, just note that they are in the back um, and uh, that as you come in or as you exit, feel free to use those plates as you would feel uh, led in terms of returning your offerings and contributions to God. Um, Also, uh, during this time, uh, we are sharing in moments of mission, and so uh, we're going to hear the mission together. So, Lori, let's make that happen. When disaster strikes, we all want to help. But when days are dark, you can't always be there to show the love of Jesus to the suffering. But someone should be there. And someone is. And you are the one who makes it happen. How? By your generous giving to UMCOR Sunday. Your support enables the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, to act as the hands and feet of Christ, embracing and supporting those in need through their darkest days. Thanks to your gift on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church, UMCOR is able to provide relief and long-term support for recovery. Not only do we provide immediate emergency assistance in the aftermath of a crisis, we also create sustainable solutions in the following months, even years of recovery long after everyone else has gone home. Your gifts form a firm foundation, a base for operations from which UMCOR can reach and serve the hurting. Your giving enables UMCOR to keep the promise that all gifts given to help a specific cause go 100% toward meeting that need. For more than 75 years, UMCOR has met the needs of the suffering. And today, we continue that labor of love and service in 80 countries around the world. Thanks to you and your generous support through UMCOR Sunday, UMCOR will continue to be there this year to show the love of Christ to children, families, and communities when disaster strikes. Because together we do more. After the Katrina hurricane swept through the the area, um, a family who had been huddled down in their house for a week Uh, decided that they needed to get out and see if they could find at the local Walmart or something else to find some food because they were kind of running out. And so got in her car and she drove up and she came to a four-way stop. And she came to the four-way stop. She found a a United Methodist Church van full of youth who were coming to help uh, provide uh, relief for uh, that immediate response was to help clear debris. And so they were shuttled up and ready to come. and, And sure enough, another car was coming this way. It was, it was a truck, a United Methodist pastor coming that direction, and he had the, the chainsaw and everything else in his truck ready to come this way. And, and coming at her, coming the other direction, was an UMCOR van with all sorts of uh, health supplies that were coming that way. She says, I've never been prouder to be a United Methodist in my life, uh, but in that moment. And so just recognize that um, one of the things that we do as a church, as we provide our donations each week, is our money helps to provide uh, funding for UMCOR uh, as we connect Uh, with what God is doing around the world. Um, Let us uh, stand as we sing the doxology together. you to be seated. As we continue in our time of worship, we have an opportunity to respond, uh, sharing of our joys and our concerns together. And so we, we lift that up. For those of you who are online, if you would like to uh, write into the comments uh, something that you would like to lift up in prayer, uh, please do so. Lori will probably yell at me about something, so it'll be good uh, just to share those and we'll make sure to share together. Uh, what uh, joys and concerns would we want to lift up together today? Yes. Yeah. For me, and I just, before I left, I just felt the Holy Spirit in their home. Amen. And I just pray for Jen and Clay. Uh, they have a big decision to make career-wise. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, they just love each other so much, and I'm just so proud. That <laughs> That's they're good. They're my kids. Amen. <laughs> So Ruthie is sharing with us uh, just the joy of being with her family in New Mexico this last two weeks yes. and uh, just celebrating the, the joy of that love that they share together. And uh, of course, for decisions they're making in the future, we're praying for them as well. So and thank you. To touch them and, hug them and you could touch them and hug them. <laughs> this is good. Yes. Other joys and concerns? Yes. Yay. So Woodsville softball. Woohoo. All right, they won yesterday. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to celebrate together, is what we're saying. It's great to celebrate together. Fantastic. Wonderful. Joys, other joys and concerns we want to lift up together. I know that as we come together, there are many concerns that we bring as we come to worship, and we look to the Lord for healing, for insight and guidance, and so I invite us to join our hearts together in prayer today. Lord, we thank you as we come in this time of worship, not only for the joy and celebration of seeing one another and being able to sing songs of praise, but knowing of your presence and of your healing and of your desire for us to be made whole. And so, Lord, as we come before you this morning with both the, the joys that have been shared and, and others that we know of in our community and our lives, we are full of confidence and thankfulness for your work of healing in our lives. But, Lord, we also look to you to continue this healing work, both in our innermost being, but also in the relationship of those of others in our community. Lord, we look to you for those who are needing of your physical touch, that you would heal their bodies, that you would heal their minds, that you would heal them in their innermost being, and that we would, through all of this, provide glory and praise to you, knowing of your wonderful deeds and wonders. And this we lift before you in Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song together, Stand By Me, and uh, hopefully you know it. <laughs> When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, now who will this wind and water stand by me? In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. We got some who want to echo. This is great. <laughs> We're ready to do that. That's fantastic. But as we uh, close in the worship service together today, I invite you to offer your hands and your hearts to God in whatever way feels comfortable for you as we receive of his blessing. Lord, that you would send your healing presence upon us, that we would know of the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, 
that we might go forth as your people to bear witness of your love to all. And this we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.